for having us today. Um, I'm really excited to do this. And it's really great to see that there's so many people from uh, so many different places visiting us. Um, as uh, Kate mentioned, my name is Mario. I am the Gallery Education Coordinator for the National Museum of Mexican Art. Uh, we have been doing virtual presentations of the museum uh, since we closed in March of 2020. Um, we uh, uh, did do some live uh, gallery tours directly from the museum, and it wasn't quite working out the way that we wanted, uh, mostly because um, we need everybody to have really great internet connection while watching us. And so that wasn't quite working out for us. So what we're doing is uh, we're going to be checking out some really great images from the permanent collection exhibit, which is titled Nuestras Historias. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with all of you. And uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, this tour will last about 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, and then I will be taking a look at the Q&A. If anyone has any questions throughout the tour, feel free to drop them in there, or we can also answer them after, um, after our, uh, our tour ends. Um, so as I mentioned, the exhibition is called Nuestras Historias. This is the largest gallery in the museum. It is the second permanent collection exhibit that the museum has uh, been able to put together. Uh, Nuestras Historias is an opportunity for us to uh, show our permanent collection uh, that has grown to over 10,000 objects of artwork over the last 34 years since we opened, right? But it's also an opportunity to remind our visitors and ourselves that um, this idea of Mexican identity is, uh, uh, is different depending on a number of things including uh, communities, times, and regions, right? And so uh, the artwork shows us uh, stories and narratives from the lives of Mexican people and Mexican artists um, and how different they can be depending on those things, but also on what side of the border you're on, right? And so uh, naturally the collection, the artwork that the museum has um, acquired over the last 34 years the, uh, it comes from both sides of the border, right? From Mexican artists from Mexico, as well as Mexican artists from the United States. Now, when you first walk into the exhibition, this is what you're gonna see. Um, you're welcomed by what is probably the most popular painting that we have in the museum that actually comes from Mexico. And I'm talking about the beautiful painting done by Jesus Elguera, titled The Legend of the Volcanoes. Now, the Legend of the Volcanoes was done in the year 1940. Jesus Elguera was one of many artists who were painting uh, stories and narratives of Mexicanos post-Mexican Revolution. Right? To give you an idea, the Mexican Revolution, this civil war, would, uh, would go on between the year 1910 and 1920, where close to 2 million people uh, would die in that war. Um, and so after so much bloodshed and after such a gruesome war, Mexico was left um, asking itself many questions, including what is our identity? Uh, what just happened in the last 10 years and where are we going next? And so there were a lot of artists, <clears throat> uh, many who were funded by the, um, uh, by the Department of Education uh, post-Mexican revolution who were hired to paint murals. And these murals are, or this public art would often talk about the history of Mexico, the history of its people, what had happened in the last, uh, at that time, in the last 400 years since the arrival of the Spanish. And it gave an opportunity for artists to really dig deep into the stories that were being preserved and that would, uh, would continue to be told. Um, other artists like Jesus Elguera, who was not exactly a, a, a public artist or a muralist, would focus more on these uh, uh, legends or these stories that had been passed down for quite some time. Often these paintings and these stories were very romanticized like this one here. Now this beautiful painting, again, which is the uh, welcome to the exhibition is titled The Legend of the Volcanoes. And it's about a story that had been passed down about these two young lovers, these two young people in love. The story says that a long time ago, the, uh, there was a young warrior whose name was Popocatépetl. Popocatépetl was a, uh, a low-ranking warrior, right? He wasn't considered to be an important uh, warrior in, the, uh, in, in this military. Therefore, uh, the, 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 the emperor, right, whose daughter was Istasiwal, the young woman next to him, uh, her father prohibited them from being together, right? These two young people had, had, had met and they had fallen in love. 
but her being the daughter of the emperor, he would need to prove that he was worthy of marrying her and being with her. So the legend says that at some point, in order to prove his love and his worthiness, he would enter this gruesome war. Uh, and during the time that Popocatépetl, the warrior, was away at war, somebody leads the young woman to believe that her beloved had been killed. Now, when Istasigualt, which was her name, learned about his, uh, his death, um, or at least she thought he was dead, uh, she becomes very sad. And the story goes on to say that eventually she dies of heartbreak, only for the young warrior to return alive and well, right, since he really was not dead, uh, and find her lifeless body on the floor. Uh, the story then goes on to say that he would pick her up and walk with her until he reaches what you see here in the painting. The young warrior would lie her body down on this rock, just like you see in the painting. He puts down his weapon and his shield, as you can see there, and he puts his arm over his chest or his hand over his chest in grief of losing his beloved. The young warrior then makes a promise to her that he would never leave her and always watch over her side. Um, it's then that these two people, these two young people eventually begin to transform into what today we see as the second and third largest mountains in all of Mexico. These two mountains are also volcanoes, which is where the painting gets its uh, name from, right? Now, these two volcanoes exist in between the state of uh, Mexico, since it is also one of the states in the country, and El Estado de Puebla, which is in the central region of the country. Um, and when people who grew up in this area or this, this, uh, in these communities, they saw these volcanoes as children, they heard this story. And the story would eventually pass on to the next generation and, uh, and so on. And so how do we keep these legends alive? Right? This painting didn't come about until 1940, which means that through word of mouth is when these, uh, uh, how these stories got passed down. Now, after the painting was done in 1940, other Mexicanos who did not live in this area would get a chance to see these volcanoes in this painting. And eventually the painting made its way to Chicago. It's been with us for almost 20 years. And as I had mentioned, it's by far one of the most popular paintings in the museum. Mexicanos that are coming to Chicago for the first time see this painting and automatically recognize it. Um, and there have even been community members that have painted their own renditions of this artwork in the neighborhood. For those of you who uh, visit Pilsen, which is a neighborhood where the museum is located in, if you uh, visit Benny's Pizzeria on 18th and Racine, you can see that they have their own rendition of this mural outside of their pizza shop, um, showing us how, uh, how important this, this story has been to Mexicanos since this painting was done. Right? <clears throat> now, uh, when you walk through the exhibition, you're gonna get a chance to go through a number of sections of the gallery including a section where we can display objects that have been found throughout Mexico's history, representing the different, uh, the different uh, communities, the different civilizations that Mexico uh, has, has seen in its history. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that these communities, right, these uh, indigenous communities are all gone. Uh, the history of Mexico has, has shown us, right, that many of those civilizations were uh, slowly wiped out or the numbers came down drastically after the Spanish uh, arrival, but that doesn't mean that some of them are not still around today. For example, the community that worked this beautiful piece of artwork known as the Huicholes or the Huixaritari. Now, the Huixaritari are a community of indigenous people that have lived in the regions of the states of Zacatecas, Jalisco, um, uh, uh, and parts of San Luis Potosí and states like Nayarit. Uh, but when we look at their history, right, if we date it back to almost 500 years when the Spanish arrived in 1519, they somehow managed to avoid contact with the Spanish for nearly 200 years. And a lot of that had to do with their location. The geographical location made it very difficult for the Spanish, right, to travel with their horses and their equipment into some of these tall uh, valleys or uh, um, some of these communities where they lived in. And so uh, today, when you speak to members of the Huichol community, uh, they refer to these areas, to these large green spaces that we call La Sierra as their protector, right? Because of the fact that it was their location that protected them from being conquered for such a long time. Now, the fact that they avoided Spanish contact for so many years means that the Huicholes 
have held on to their language, to their culture, including their artwork, their food, right? Uh, their traditions and their celebrations, including their beliefs of where life started. Some of these communities make reference to the beginning of, uh, of, uh, uh, of human life starting um, out at the sea, and eventually we moved into the land, right? But some of these stories are found in this piece of artwork, which includes 80 tiles of artwork or 80 tiles of, uh, of wood, um, and every single tile that you see here, we are looking at eight of them that make up two different images within the, 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 the piece. Um, every single tile of wood is filled with thousands of small glass beads. This artwork is known as Arte de Chakira. The Chakira makes reference to the small little tiny glass beads and in total, including all the 80 tiles uh, of, uh, uh, of artwork that you saw in the big piece, it includes close to 2 million pieces of beads. And every single little bead is held onto this, uh, the, these, these wood tiles with a wax called campeche, which is a beeswax. Now this wax remains sticky, right? And so by, by staying sticky at the right temperature, the beads are held on tightly into place and you can see that this piece has been with the museum since 2003. So nearly 20 years later, the piece is fully intact and the beads are still in place. Now, the piece was a project that took these, uh, um, these artists, this community, uh, over one year to finish, right? Because of the, uh, the massive size of the piece and of course, the, the process, right? Which is extremely time consuming to lay down these beads one by one into the wax. Uh, before, of course, finishing the final product. I will say, I'm going to go back to the uh, the original piece, that there are actually three of these done in the world. We do not have the only one. There, There is one in Chicago. It's the only one in the United States. It's uh, at the museum. Uh, and then there is one in the state of Zacatecas in Mexico. And then the third one is actually found in Paris near the Louvre. Um, and so uh, the, the piece is no longer on display where it was for many years outside of the Louvre uh, near Metro Station, but it is still found in Paris. Uh, now I'm going to take a quick pause here to answer some of these questions. Um, the audio seems to be garbled. Okay, so this, this, this might be uh, your, your connections, everyone. I think my connection is showing to be pretty steady right now, but I am going to answer this question. We are located in Pilsen which is uh, only about 10 minutes away from downtown Chicago, uh, just, uh, just southeast, uh, southwest, I'm sorry, of the Loop, uh, what is considered downtown Chicago. Um, the museum does not have an exact reopening date yet, uh, Merle, but uh, we are hoping that we can open our doors by September, uh, depending on how things are going. Um, and uh, we, but again, we don't have an actual opening uh, date uh, yet, right? Now, uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this piece, but as far as the pathways, that's an interesting observation. These pathways that you're making reference to, Gloria, um, are, uh, are roads or a line that connect these four stories together. Um, so, you know, we're not going to get too much into each one of them represents, but, but we know that when the artist created these they wanted us to connect the, these four pieces together. And notice how, how the piece is very symmetrical, right? Um, it's almost like if you're mirroring one side to the next one, right? And so there's a lot of balance found in this piece of artwork. The only, uh, the, the, the only thing that might stand out in this piece that isn't really part of that balance, if you notice, is that the circle in the center Right, this round uh, image created by these four tiles is a little bit lower. It's not quite in the center of the piece, right? And so I think of it almost as this, uh, like a scale, right? kind of balancing both sides out. Uh, the type of wax could handle the heat over time. I'm not sure exactly what type of wax outside of Campeche would be able to use this, but, uh, but, but it's, it, this particular style of Campeche, again, as long as it's kept in the right temperature, uh, it, it should hold just fine, right? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. So we're going to move, move along and, uh, we're going to take a look at another very well-known piece in the collection. Some of you might recognize her image as soon as you see her. And I am talking about La Virgen de Guadalupe. 
A la Virgen de Guadalupe is uh, what is considered the, uh, uh, the, the Mexican Catholic image of, of the Virgin Mary, right? Uh, it's a very specific image that carries a specific iconography that uh, connects her to Mexico. Now, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe's legend or her story says that she first appeared to an indigenous man back in the 1500s, uh, that there was a miraculous apparition at the top. Oh, I'm sorry about that. There was a miraculous apparition at the top of, the, uh, of a small mountain um, in where uh, she appeared to Juan Diego. Now, Juan Diego, right, was indigenous according to the legend, and she appeared to him, right? Now, the, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe's uh, image, right, uh, carries three icons that make her special. One of them is the fact that she stands over a crescent moon, which you see right above the angel holding her up, right? And then you see the sun shining behind her, right? That kind of creates an aura around her. And then last but not least, if you look at her cloak, right, that is over her dress and her head, it is filled with stars. And so these three, uh, these three symbols or these three features of her image uh, were resembling to an Aztec goddess, an indigenous goddess named Tonantzin. And it was believed that Tonantzin was uh, referred to as being the mother of the universe, the goddess of all goddesses. So naturally, when the story says that this, this image appeared, that she appeared to an indigenous man, um, it was an uh, instrumental tool in the conversion of Catholicism of the natives to Mexico. And what really makes this story interesting is that it, it, it uh, uh, according to the legend, it happened only 10 years after the fall of Tenochtitlan the fall of the Aztec empire to the Spanish, right? So a lot of scholars have even debated the timing of her actual apparition and how that there's not any documents that, that, that prove her apparition until at least the 1600s, right? And so although there's, there's a lot of questions as to whether the apparition happened that year, some people question whether the apparition happened, right? And that's uh, that goes hand in hand with religious stories and, and legends. Um, there's no doubt that the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe is now the most important cultural icon to many people in Mexico. Because even those that are not Catholic, and even those who maybe don't believe in the apparition of La Virgen de Guadalupe during the 1500s, we now understand that her image really is a representation of what we call mestizaje which is making reference to the idea that being a Mexicano, right, means that we have combined backgrounds, that we are not just indigenous, we are not just Spanish European, right? There are many other uh, um, roots that have affected our identity as Mexicanos. One that is being talked about more now than ever is the third root of Mexico, which is Africa. And uh, uh, some years back in 2006, the museum had an exhibition titled The African Presence in Mexico, which made reference to the third root of Mexicanos, right? Um, and it added more complexity to our idea of identity and mestizaje. Now, the last thing I'm gonna mention about this painting, everybody, you notice that the dates uh, is a 28 year gap. We don't know exactly when this painting was done but we know that it was done somewhere between 1740 and 1768 because it was during those 28 years that the artist Miguel Cabrera had a massive uh, studio in where he was painting these in mass production as he had been hired by the Spanish crown who, were, uh, who occupied Mexico until 1821 after, uh, after it, gained, it gained its independence um, in order to really um, distribute and spread this image of the Virgen de Guadalupe throughout Mexico. As I mentioned, it was instrumental in the conversion of Catholicism as a country, right? And so Miguel Cabrera had this, this studio where at the very end of this large artist assembly line, he would sign the paintings, as you see on the bottom left side of the piece, and he would add the final details and final touches to every single painting that left that studio. Now, just a quick reference to another piece in the collection, right? Uh, <clears throat> that also features La Virgen de Guadalupe 
is this really great piece by uh, Cesar Martinez. He is an, uh, an artist from Texas, from San Antonio. And uh, this piece shows us uh, that he combined two very important women figures, one in the world of European artwork, uh, the Mona Lisa, right, that is considered to be the best known, uh, the most visited, the most written about, the most sung about, and the most parodied work of art in the world, right? And so he took um, the, the image of the Mona Lisa and created a mestizaje, a mixing of, uh, of these two paintings uh, with the Virgen de Guadalupe, right? So you can see that he took the three uh, features that we associate with her image, the sun behind her, the cloak over her dress with the stars, and the crescent moon that we typically see at the bottom of her feet was brought up so that she can rest her hands on it, uh, and, um, just like La Mona Lisa. Now, uh, this is another piece that's not obviously inside the museum. I wanted to show you this beautiful mural that was done just two blocks away from the museum. Uh, this mural was done by the artist Miguel del Real. Uh, he uh, completed it in 2017. And it just goes to show, right, the, the images and the icons that are being preserved in the neighborhood within public artwork. Uh, this painting was a upgrade uh, over the original mural that was there from 1993 all the way to 2017. By 2017, the original mural had been mostly washed out. Um, obviously, murals are vulnerable to the natural elements. And so uh, the, the family who owns this building hired Miguel del Real uh, to, to redo this painting of the Virgen de Guadalupe on a much bigger scale. Uh, and this was the final product. Now, I shouldn't say final product because I spoke to Miguel not too long ago, the artist, and he mentioned that he never completed this painting. There are still things that he wants to go back and finish. Uh, he stopped working on it uh, when COVID happened right, where everybody just kind of went into our, our homes. So I'm hoping that uh, the artist continues this piece, whatever final details uh, he will add to it. This is uh, at the intersection of Cullerton Street and Wood, in case any of you are interested in checking it out. Now, the next section of the gallery introduces us a little bit to the folk art, or what we call in Mexico, Arte Popular. Arte Popular includes all the images and the beautiful vibrant colors that we expect to see when we talk about Mexican artwork, right? Uh, we, we used to have a lot of fun with students and ask them what they expect to see when they come into a Mexican art museum. And the responses were exactly as we thought, which were they expect to see vibrant colors. They expected to see references to uh, religious icons, which we've already seen. And the, the most popular answer was always, they expected to see skulls or skeletons, which you'll absolutely see during this presentation. But this idea of, of, uh, of uh, popular art, arte popular, at some point became the embraced and the expected narrative of artwork from Mexicanos. And a part of that is the folk art tradition in Mexico. Now, uh, this really beautiful piece, which you can see is titled uh, Self-Portrait with Family, was done by the folk artist Josefina Aguilar. She is out of the state of Oaxaca, uh, more specifically out of the town of Ocotlan de Morelos. She is a member of the Aguilar family who are best known for creating small clay figurines. These specific ones are called muñecas or dolls, right? Uh, this muñeca or doll is a self-portrait and if you look at the different parts of it, at the bottom of her dress, it includes family members and people who live in her town uh, who uh, are, are doing everyday uh, things, uh, what we call in Spanish, la vida cotidiana, right? Uh, these, these depictions uh, include everyday village activities, uh, religious and folkloric scenes. She also creates famous figures. Uh, she has made many very, uh, um, uh, very popular figures of Frida Kahlo, who was arguably the most famous artist in the history of Mexico, right? Um, and she also does a lot of Day of the Dead statues as well, right? Now, uh, she learned these techniques from her mother, like the rest of her sisters did. And like many other folk artists or artesanos who work with their hands, uh, a lot of them are not school taught. 
Uh, these skills and these techniques are passed down by family members, in this case, her mother. Uh, now, uh, one of the collectors that, that first collected her work uh, was uh, no other than Nelson Rockefeller. And on a trip down to Mexico in Oaxaca in 1975, uh, the story says that he purchased every single piece of artwork that was made uh, available for him to buy. Uh, and so he brought these beautiful pieces back to the United States. And it was then that other collectors really started to pay attention to the work of the Aguilar family. Right. Um, today, a large part of the market of Arte Popular is found on this side of the border, right? So that hasn't changed. Now, one thing that really makes Josefina Aguilar's story unique as an artist is the fact that in uh, 2014, uh, seven years ago now, she lost her vision. Um, but Josefina Aguilar never stopped working. Uh, and so one of her collectors actually quoted her saying that she continues to work with her sculptures because it's not the eyes, instead it's the hands and the brain, right? And so this is, um, it's, it's memory to her. She's been creating these now her whole life and losing her vision in the last seven years has not stopped her from creating. And it's extremely inspirational to us at the museum uh, when, when, when this happened to her. Um, now in that same section is one of my favorite pieces in the whole museum. And it's, uh, it's very different. Right, I just talked about what we expect to see when we look at Mexican artwork, right? The vibrant colors and the skulls and the, uh, the religious icons, references to food, which we absolutely have in the exhibition as well. But in the 1980s, right, uh, there was a new group of artists that would call themselves the Neo-Mexicanos or the New Mexicans. Uh, the Neo-Mexicanismo art movement in a way rejected what had been accepted widely as Mexican artwork, right? These uh, artists were not interested in talking about their identities. They were not interested in talking about their villages. They weren't interested in, in painting skulls or painting Virgens de Guadalupe, right? The art, artist like Gunter Gerzo, uh, who was actually uh, towards the end of his career and the end of his life uh, when, when this painting was done, were, were, were looking to move away from that. They were looking to move away from the traditional and instead bringing it back to uh, elements of artwork, right? Such as this one, which is titled Yellow, Green, Blue, right? A very straightforward title for a painting that includes those colors uh, that forces us to really think about artwork in a different, about Mexican artwork in a different light where we can appreciate the colors and we can appreciate the lines and we can appreciate the depth of these shapes on top of each other. And it really forces us to see it in a different way, right? Now, it's not that artists like Gunter Gerzo and other artists didn't uh, love the traditional aspects of Mexico because I'm sure they did, but it was more about not being boxed in into a particular form of artwork, right? And it became really difficult for artists to, and you can still say today, for Mexican artists to simply be identified as artists who are Mexican, versus a Mexican artist. And when you're expected to paint a certain thing or a certain way. Now, Gunter Gerzo spent a large part of his life, not as a painter, but as a set designer. For those of you who, who are familiar with the golden age of cinema in Mexico, where some of the, uh, some really beautiful movies came out of uh, as far as scenery and as far as set design. And, uh, and, and, and if you're familiar with actresses like Maria Felix and actors like Pedro Infante, who are the faces of that era, um, he worked on the set design for a lot of those movies as a young artist. So he really didn't embrace his painting and a lot of this abstract painting until a later part of his life. Now, the next section of the gallery is the developing identities of Mexicans in the United States. You can see that this is where the Mona Lupe is found, uh, as well as some of the next pieces we are going to see. Uh, this is the, by far the largest uh, section of the gallery, by the way, right? Um, this first beautiful painting is done by Patsy Valdez. Uh, Patsy Valdez is an artist who grew up in East Los Angeles. She was the only Chicana, the only uh, woman in the performance group of ASCO. ASCO was a collective of artists uh, of Chicanos, uh, of Mexican-American artists who were part of the Mexican-American art movement, better known as the Chicano art movement, which became very political. 
Uh, Patsy Valdez is not just a painter, but she does performance artwork, uh, conceptual art installations, murals, and she's even dabbled in fashion design. Uh, many of her paintings like this one here are set in an interior space. Uh, they evoke internal thoughts and feelings, uh, very nostalgic artwork. And she has stated numerous times that she uses a lot of movement in her work uh, to keep the paintings alive, right? And it creates a feeling that someone just left the space or the room. And you can see that particularly with the shoes at the bottom of the painting. Now the shoes are on the floor uh, where this ofrenda is located. This ofrenda or this offering is a small setup that we find usually during the Day of the Dead. The ofrenda or the offering is created to honor those that passed away and according to tradition to welcome back the souls of our loved ones during November 1st and 2nd every single year. You're going to notice that the name of the painting though is October and it's really interesting because although the Day of the Dead happens the first two days of November, the preparation for this holiday really begins throughout the month of October. Whether you begin to purchase objects to put on your ofrenda, whether you're in a small town in Mexico and you start collecting flowers ahead of time, and you start collecting food to prepare at the, uh, uh, at the beginning of November, right? So it's really October that rings at, at, in, uh, in our heads as Mexicanos as the time we prepare for the Day of the Dead, right? It's a, um, it, it's a, a, a very fitting name for this painting. Now, uh, the, uh, the artist, uh, Patsy Valdez, as I mentioned, was part of the Chicano art movement. Uh, artists really fought for their place in the world of the arts during this time. They fought for the rights to be successful as artists. And, uh, and, and, and this is the second reference to uh, a European painting that we have by Chicano artists, right? I'm making reference, of course, to the work of, uh, of Dutch artists, post-impression um, uh, post-impressionist Van Gogh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, right? So Starry Night is absolutely a reference there in the back uh, uh, here on the window. Now, this work by Carmen Lomas Garza is about a celebration, the celebration of Las Posadas. Las Posadas is a nine-day celebration that uh, celebrates the birth of, uh, of Jesus. Um, and it includes families gathering together uh, and even children dressing up, right? So you can see that the, the, the children here were asked to dress like Joseph and Mary. They are at the front of the group. There are many things about this painting that tells us it's a celebration or something they're doing together. There's a lot of movement from left to right. Uh, the posadas, uh, is uh, again this nine day celebration where the family knocks on doors and they ask their neighbors if they can come in and sing some songs that of course are related to the birth of Jesus. But also the woman who is allowing them in, you can see she has opened her door for them. She's wearing an apron and it might be because she's still in the process of preparing food for these people, right? So you will welcome them into your home you provide them with something warm to drink since the posadas are celebrated in December. So while the adults might drink coffee, the children might be offered some hot chocolate, right? Um, uh, and the, the woman might have prepared some light food for them to eat or to snack on before the family moves on into the next home, right? And does it all over again. And one of the really great things about this painting are the visual clues that the artist drops for us. Now, the first thing you should know about this painting is that it is set in 1958. And I know that because the story has, uh, the artist has told us this story about when she was 10 years old. And she paints herself in this painting as a 10 year old girl, right in the center of the painting. She's wearing her big shiny red boots. She's looking in art direction, right? That also kind of sets her apart. Now it's, it's uh, not only her and her boots that caught my attention, but if two people ahead of her, the kid dressed as Joseph, who might be her older cousin or her older brother, he got away with wearing his chucks, right? His Chuck Taylors made by Converse at this point had become an American cultural icon. Everybody needed to have a pair, right? It was introduced about 30 years before that. And so what we see in this painting is a family preserving this Mexican tradition, Mexican Catholic tradition of Las Posadas, but also 
right? Uh, introduce, being introduced to new things in American culture, right? Texas having a very unique identity as well at some point was part of Mexico, but it became part of the US after the US-Mexican war. And uh, one thing that really sets them apart as well, right? Is the fact that there was this, uh, this feeling or this, this, this uh, notion of identity that they didn't belong on either side. And so in a way it was kind of taking from both cultures and creating their own identity from it. Now, Gloria, as far as the land being elevated, uh, that's gonna be the last point of here, which is even if you're not familiar with posadas, if you're not familiar with Mexican celebrations, that the, the elevated lamb is one of the clues that tells us this is a celebration or a party. Because if you look at the bottom of, of the lamb's legs are these kind of a streamer style papers, which tells us that this is a piñata, right? And so uh, children, right, are a big part of this celebration. And you can't have a, uh, uh, you can't celebrate a child without a piñata, right? And they're very common to find in children's birthday parties in Mexico and amongst Mexican families here in the United States. Again, this is the work of Carmen Lomas Garza. Now, we're gonna take a look at a painting that has three different faces to it. Uh, the painting is done by Esther Hernandez, another uh, very well-known Chicana artist, Mexican-American artist. She created this piece actually back in the 70s. Uh, the original print that inspired her to make this painting, she did it in the 70s, but she created this installation in 89, as you can see. Um, Esther Hernandez worked at some point when she was young, when she was a teenager, uh, as a field worker. And although she didn't work as a field worker full time, right, she was a student, it's something that she experienced. So the first thing you need to know about this painting from this angle is that the woman you see in that painting has coverings over her face, right? She's protecting herself from something. And in her hand is a tool that helps her cut grapes. And she collected grapes out in the fields for many farmers that were contracted by companies like the Sun Made Raisin Company, right? Which we've all, I'm sure, heard of. Uh, the second image that you see here is the center of the painting when you are standing right in front of it. And it shows us that Sun, Mad Sun Made Raisins Company was one of the companies that was using uh, herbicides and, and, and fungicides and different chemicals out in the fields during work hours contaminating the air of the farm workers or the field workers. And so when she created this piece, it was to bring attention to that. It was to bring consciousness of what was happening around us. Consciousness to the people that were buying this company's product at the store. And it was no, uh, no uh, uh, surprise that some of the work these artists were doing to bring consciousness fell right into the work that was being done by people like Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, who were the founders of the United Farm Workers. Eventually their work, right, uh, would, would also help uh, workers all around the United States, right, fight for, for their labor rights. Uh, now the third angle of this piece is similar to the first one, but it, this, this uh, young woman is now a skeleton, showing us that some of these workers eventually were getting very sick and cancer rates skyrocketed in some of the areas where these farmers were working. And it, was, and, and it was led to believe that it was because of the pesticides. Now, the bottom of this installation is an ofrenda, right? And you can see that it's in memory of, her art, uh, of the artist's father. But the ofrenda at the bottom includes some of the traditional elements of the Day of the Dead, such as objects that belong to the person or that we associated with the person's life. In this case, of course, the objects represent the life of a, of a field worker, the sombrero that protects them from the sun while they're working, that large brown container, which is where they, that they had to fill with grapes over and over again. And the four candles around the circle are a representation of the four cardinal points. And the artist mentioned that um, it's important to know where you're at at all times when you're working in the field. Sometimes everything starts to look the same, right? And so. It's important to know your sense of direction as a worker, but it's also a very beautiful metaphorical way of uh, providing guidance to the souls during the day of the dead to find their way back home. Everybody, we're gonna take a look at one final painting and it's the work of Mario Castillo. 
He was the first Mexican artist to paint an outdoor mural in Chicago back in 1968, eventually would end up working as a professor at Columbia College, an art school here in downtown Chicago. And uh, he painted this in 1996, and it is titled, bear with me here, The Ancient Memories of Mayahuel's People Still Breathe. Mayahuel's people is making reference to all the civilizations that came before us. And uh, Mayahuel, more specifically, was the goddess of the maguey plant, which is the plant that you see behind the woman in the back here. The maguey plant is used for many different things, including the use of making tequila. Uh, now, Mayahuel, right, is represented here as this purple woman created from the universe, right? And there seems to be a child in her arms a reference to her being the mother of creation maybe, but you can see that there's an energy source, an energy wave that is coming from her. And in a way it's providing life to the rest of this painting. If you look closely, you can see that through the nose and the mouth of the man standing in the back, he is breathing in this energy. The same way that this figure at the bottom who is known as Chak Mol, who is uh, often associated with Mayan cultures in Southern Mexico is also breathing in that same air. The jaguar and the serpent on the at the top and at the bottom of the right side of the painting are representations of Aztec culture or the Mexica who believe that Quetzalcoatl, this feathered serpent on the bottom corner was a God who was responsible for the creation of life on earth. Right, And even he is breathing in these yellow and orange uh, lines that are representing the energy coming from her. Now, all these civilizations are representative of different parts of Mexico. They do not come from one area. But the fact that this massive painting, by the way, it's probably about 14 feet long. Um, it's by far the largest painting in the museum. This massive painting is here in Chicago. It's a reference to all civilizations that came from Mexico and that Mexicans associate with, but it's here in a city where the Mexican population is very large and where a museum opened its doors 34 years ago because of the need of a place for Mexicans to celebrate their culture and their identity. So it's no surprise that the painting has been with us for so long and it's been on display ever since the artist donated to us back in the year 2000. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to wrap up our virtual tour. Uh, I am going to hand it back over to Kate uh, to see if we maybe have a few minutes for Q&A um, or answer any questions that I might have missed throughout the, the, the chat, Kate. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mario. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I hope all of you did, too. Um, we do have a few minutes, if you do, to answer some questions. I'm just gonna sort through a little bit here. Let's see. Um, I did miss a, a question here um, about Diego Rivera. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we do have a Diego Rivera painting uh, in the museum. It's not currently on display, but it's actually a painting that he did uh, um, uh, of a portrait uh, of a wealthy person back at the time. So it's not the traditional stuff we're used to seeing by Diego, which is often really political stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as, uh, um, in case some of you don't know, the work of Frida and the work of Diego, like many other artists uh, uh, um, of their time, their contemporaries, uh, it's very hard to acquire and it's difficult to bring unless you bring a whole exhibition uh, from Mexico or from a private collector, right? So th that's why it's, it, it's, it's very rare that you're gonna see a lot of, of their work at, at, at smaller museums like ours. Um, we have had an exhibition um, about 15 years ago, 18 years ago, uh, that, that featured both the work of Frida and Diego. It was a, a, a whole uh, uh, exhibit uh, which came before my time at the museum, unfortunately. Okay, this is a good question. Are there any traveling exhibits that go through the museum? Traveling exhibits, absolutely. Uh, so some of the exhibitions that we have 
uh, come from other institutions, whether they come from Mexico or uh, other organizations here in the United States. For the most part, um, so I've been at the museum for about 15 years now, and um, I want to say that over the last 10 years, we, we've tried to rely less on traveling exhibitions, um, and, and, and we curate the majority of them in-house now. Uh, the, uh, some of our exhibitions have traveled, though, such as the African Presence in Mexico, which was by far one of our most successful exhibitions, and it traveled uh, all of 2006 and 2007. It went to Philadelphia. It, uh, it was in, I believe, California. It went down to Mexico, and it came back to close at the DuSable Museum in 2007, uh, one year later. Very cool. Lots of people want to know about the Day of the Dead exhibit. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. So the Day of the Dead exhibition typically opens uh, in mid-September and it runs all the way through the first week of December. Uh, the exhibition is, uh, of course, about the Day of the Dead tradition and the celebration and the way that it's curated. It's always so that people uh, who are first time learners about the Day of the Dead can learn about the other muertos in the first couple of rooms. And then afterwards, the artwork becomes a little bit more contemporary and a little bit more modern, right? Where it becomes interpretations of artists talking about the Day of the Dead. Um, the exhibition is by far our busiest time. And as I had mentioned earlier, it looks like we might be reopening in September. So for those of you that are interested, please follow us on Facebook um, and, or, or uh, our website, which is currently being reworked and it should launch in, uh, in, in September, hopefully. Um, all that information will be there because we definitely will either have a ticketed system or a reservation system uh, since, since we're going to have to be very careful when, when we reopen. Absolutely. Do you happen to know the size of the beaded installation? You know what? I can tell you right off the bat that that piece is at least, uh, so it's one foot coming this way every, and there's eight, 10 of them. So it's 10 feet wide by eight feet tall. Um, every single tile, every single tile is uh, one square foot, and it's about uh, it's about eighty square feet. Wow. When yeah. visiting the museum, is a docent available to give tours and explain the paintings like you did today? You did a wonderful job presenting. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we we do have a uh, free monthly public tours uh, um, at the museum. Um, we uh, during the vert during this virtual world, we've been doing them every week. Um, and, and, but uh, during the time that we're open, we have them at least once a month and they're typically open to the first 45 people who register. Um, if anyone is interested in reserving a private tour, we also do that for, for cost. Um, and, and we also give tours to students and teachers uh, um, and different, uh, uh, different organizations. Great. Are there any works by Chicago-based artists in the collection? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the last, that last uh, painting that we saw, that big painting is in a room called Chicago and Urban Immigrant Identity. And so that last part of the section is reserved just for Chicago-based Mexican artists. So um, just off the top of my head, Mario Castillo, who we talked about, Hector Duarte, who lives right around the corner from the museum, uh, is one of the other artists, Marco Raya, who was an artist that came from Mexico in 1968. Now he's been here for a long time. Um, uh, and uh, artists like Oscar Moya, Elsa Munoz. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There's a whole dedicated part of the exhibition just for Chicago-based Mexican artists. That's a, it's a really important point of view as far as identity for us to display, right? Because the history of the museum opening in the city is such a big deal. And it, it's really a testimony to why the museum opened and why um, it was a necessity, right? Um, and then I saw, I saw a question here about, uh, give me one second. Oh, the, about the DuPage. So College of DuPage does plan to have the Frida exhibition. That was supposed to open in 2020, um, if, if some of you remember, and unfortunately it didn't happen. Although we won't be sending any work their way, uh, we have talked to them. Uh, we, we, we did have meetings with them where we talked about possible uh, cross-programming, uh, but, but, but we don't have any, uh, um, any works in that exhibition. That whole exhibit is coming from one big private collection uh, from Mexico over to the College of DuPage. That is cool. I did not uh, know that. Mm -hmm. yep. 
The location of the outdoor mural, by the way, was on Cullerton and Wood. Uh, uh, I believe Mary was asking. So that's that's Cullerton and Wood. It's just one block uh, east of the museum. Public school, absolutely. Some public schools have Mexican artwork. There's a lot of of uh, elementary schools in 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 Chicago and uh, particularly in the Little Village area that have a lot of outdoor murals that connected to Mexican culture or symbolism in one way. Off the top of my head, Canoon Elementary is one located on 24th and Kedzie. McCormick Elementary is another one that's just about four or five blocks away from there. Um, there yeah, but there's plenty of them. And uh, again, we don't have any official associations with any other uh, organizations or museums, but but we always do some type of partnerships. We we you know there there's always meetings about um, uh, about how we can work together, right? The Mexican community in Chicago is one thing, but it's important for us to reach Mexican communities also throughout the United States, and that's one of, been one of the uh, of, of the uh, kind of silver linings of the pandemic that we have had an opportunity to reach communities that we didn't reach before, right? Because we're using this virtual platform. I mean, the fact that we're talking to over 200 people here, nearly 300 people, right? Um, uh, maybe all of you wouldn't have gotten a chance to make it uh, physically to the museum. And this is a great way for us to, uh, to do that. Juarez is another one. Thank you, Mary. Absolutely. Uh, Juarez is also located right down the street from the museum. Uh, and graffiti style artwork by contemporary Mexican artists. I'm really glad you asked that. Uh, in July, we will be uh, unveiling, uh, although the museum won't be open, we're gonna be doing some virtual programming around uh, a, a piece that we just acquired uh, by Chaz Bojorquez. Uh, Chaz Bojorquez is considered to be the godfather of, gra the, uh, of, uh, of graffiti style artwork uh, and really the graffiti artist of his time. Uh, he, he's older now. Uh, we've had him at the museum before, but he creates beautiful, beautiful paintings uh, that, that are graffiti styled studio works. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. That's, again, that artist is Chad, uh, Chaz Bojorquez uh, out of California. Fantastic. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. We got some easy ones for you. Do you have a gift shop? We do have a gift shop and uh, a, a part of that is available on our website, um, nationalmuseumofmexicanart.org, but the actual gift shop is still closed for, for in-person sales, but it will be reopening in September. It's a beautiful gift shop. It's not uh, massive by any means, but um, it, all the products that, not all the products, but the majority of the, of the products sold come from Mexico, especially folk art and some of the stuff that we saw. Um, and then we've also started to sell artwork by some of the local vendors uh, that are also Mexicanos. Awesome. Yeah, I, I haven't been for a long time, but I, I'm sure when I was there was around the time of the Day of the Dead exhibit when you guys are the most busy, but there was a lot of cool stuff. Um, yeah. Somebody wants to know where they can find some of the museum's virtual offerings. So maybe we should put a link in there for them. Yeah, for sure. Let me let me get that link for you now, actually. Um, we, we have something called NMMA at home. Um, and this is where you can basically find a list of the things that are available for uh, for for families and um, and and students. Let me get that link up for you. Great. Yeah, if you can post it in the chat, that way everybody can um, kind of browse it at their own leisure. And a reminder to all of you that are still in attendance to that these tours and these museums depend on the support of their community to operate and this past year has been very difficult for them and I hope that once they reopen you will consider going down and buying a ticket and and visiting in person and just let's get that in there all right so I just dropped the link here oh I'm sorry I think I might have just sent it to the panelists let me send it to everyone okay perfect so you know what, actually, it seems that um, I don't have permission to send it to everyone. I could just send it to the panelists, I believe. I'll copy it and send it to everybody. Thank you. All right, guys, there you go. Okay, and I think we're just gonna finish up. Let's take a one last look here. So we know you have a gift shop. How does parking work? Do you guys have a parking lot or is it street parking? So that's another exciting thing happening right now. We, after 34 years, the museum finally has a parking lot. It is uh, currently uh, being finished up though. 
Uh, they started working on it a couple months back and, um, and the, the parking lot should be open by the time the museum reopens it's in September. Um, so it's gonna be, it's located just um, on, the, on, the, on the east side of the museum. Uh, so the building is located right at 19th and Walcott and the parking lot is gonna be right next to that. Uh, there's also plenty of street parking. We're, 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 on a, um, we're in the middle of a Chicago public uh, park. Um, and so uh, there's definitely plenty of parking uh, surrounding the park area for, for free. Awesome. Well, thank you very much again, Mario. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. I hope everybody here did. Um, I thank you again, all of my partner libraries. This is something that never would have been possible without COVID. So I guess that's like one positive, but um, it was a great experience. And if you guys have a few minutes and you want to stick around and just fill out that survey, it's very quick. They're all multiple choice questions. So we can get some feedback from you. I'd really appreciate it. And I will be sending out a link to the recording um, to all of you who have registered and attended today if you want to view the presentation again or share it with your friends and family. I hope everybody has a great rest of their weekend and I'll see you guys all soon. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Bye, Bye, thanks everyone.